So when you're meeting with clients and you're meeting with anybody, anybody, you should just be yourself because they'll want to work with you. So to me, it's about building the love and telling people I love what I do because you should love what you do. Right. Um, and just tell people that tell everybody how much they love you, love what you do and they'll want to work with you and they're going to tell everybody else that how much you love the work. Welcome to the Passion Behind the Art Show. It's all about diving in with individuals to learn the story behind their passion. It's your host, Daryl Penny. What's up? Guess what? It's another week, another amazing guest, and another opportunity for me to bring you value through someone else's story. But before we jump into this week's episode, I just want to let you know that our Patreon page is up and running, finally. And if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's basically a way to support a specific endeavor that you're interested in. And of course, the endeavor that we're talking about right now is Passion Behind the Art, the podcast. So I'd really appreciate it if you would support the podcast through our Patreon page. All you need to do is just go to passionbandart.com and look for the Patreon tab and it will take you directly to the page. This would mean the world to me and everything that I'm doing in regards to the podcast. A large percentage of what I do in regards to the podcast, as a matter of fact, all of it is free. And I would really appreciate you if you could just help support the podcast with as low as $2. Nothing too crazy. And of course, there's various tiers you can support with more and the more you support, the more incentives you get. So just go to passionbanderart.com and check out our Patreon page. This would help me out a lot. There will also be a link in the show notes. So without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. Well, I am beyond excited to have Emily Cohen on the Passion Band Art Show She's just a creative strategist. Um, I'm not sure if she would like me to say this, but she's a beast when it comes to stuff like this. So I'm pretty (laughs) excited to have her on the show. Emily, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's jump right into it. Um, As far back as you would like to go, how did this creative journey start for you? Well, it's interesting. So um, I would say that it, I don't have a lot of memories of far, far back. And, um, but as as long as I remember, my father always encouraged me to be an artist, um, which is very unusual because I'm Jewish. And, um, I think most parents in general don't like encourage their kids to be artists necessarily. Um, but mine did, uh, which was awesome. So I went to art classes and I, you know, and also as a little crazy kid, I dressed crazy and, you know, I did all the artist things. And so I guess I was born to be an artist. Um, and I, you know, I did like, went to like art classes after school and I was part of the art crowd in high school. And then I went to, um, design school. I went to school for painting. Um, and then pretty quickly realized painting wasn't necessarily a way to money. So I moved to graphic design. Um, so I graduated a graphic design degree. Um, and pretty much it was all under my current admit, primarily my father. My parents were very big cultural people. We went to a lot of museums and I think I think in retrospect, now that I'm in my, uh, later in life, I realize this is my father's dreams, not mine. <laughs> so he actually, it's really interesting. He, um, when my mother passed, mm, uh, my father became an artist. Oh, that's okay. It's a long time ago. But what was funny about that was my father immediately became an artist. Like it was, uh, so I think it was him who wanted to be an artist more than I knew it was me. But once I was in college, I found my people, right? So I loved all the people that were in art school and because it was an art, drama, music. It was all these great people. Um, so I graduated with a design degree. Um, and I worked as a designer, a practicing designer, for like seven years. But I really quickly realized that I wasn't great at it. <laughs> and I'm super ambitious. Um, and I was realizing that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And so that's why I made the, and so I had this kind of career crisis because I was, I love the people of the creative community. Like I love them and they're my friends and my, it was my whole network. Um, but, and I didn't want to lose that, but I didn't also want to be a designer anymore. Um, 
because I just wasn't, I was good, but I wasn't great. Like, you know, just, you know, when you're not good and I'm super ambitious and I want to be the best that I could possibly be. Um, and so I just asked a bunch of people what I should do for my life. I was like at this moment, like I was 25 maybe. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and everybody's like, you're really good at kicking people's butts. That's what you should do. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> which meant, basically meant that I was really good at bossing up people around and like, and being organized. And like, I was always the one that talked to all the clients and I was the ones who organized every party for all my friends, you know? So that's what I started doing. And I started managing a studio, um, that I managed for about seven years. So it was the best possible combination of me being like still in the artist community, still working with creatives. Um, still like I was art directing illustrators and I worked with, you know, photographers and that was awesome, but I got to be like on the management side of it and which I really liked. Um, so yeah, that's how that happened. I have a very boring kind of like creative story, but that's basically. <laughs> no, but it's, 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 it's interesting. Like, what would you say kind of like, struck that chord i know you said like you, you didn't really feel like you were a great designer but like yeah. what would you say kind of struck that chord to say okay yeah outside of that yeah i could tell you honestly it was seeing people that were better than me so i was working at a company um in new york they had a boston office called Corey and company and they were pretty famous at the time and they at the time they had designed nickelodeon's logo so they were pretty well known um and they had opened a new york office and i was one of the designers on the team. And there were three other designers above me that were just, or two that were about my level. And then one of them that was above me and they were just so much better than me. You know, they just, mm. it came naturally to them and I just, it didn't come naturally to me. It took me longer to come to the ideas. I didn't see, like, I remember thinking, I don't understand color. Like I just didn't understand <laughs> what they saw. I just pretty picked pretty colors, you know, and I didn't get color theory and um, I didn't see the subtleties of fonts. I just didn't have that level. I just knew, I just knew that. And also, mm. honestly, I'll be really honest. I just knew that because I wasn't going to be great. I was never going to make a lot of money in it. And I mm. kind of wanted to make money. Yeah. You know, That's a nice uh, thing. yeah, it was just my, dr <laughs> I'm, I'm driven by money, which is what, what makes me a great business consultant. Cause I make my clients, you know, understand that money is important, but I also understand, mm -hmm. I also understand the value of creativity and being following your passion. So I'm really lucky. Matter of fact, I was in a lift today. And the Lyft driver asked me, which was really kind of sweet. He goes, so I want to know, do you like what you do? He doesn't even know what I do. And he just wanted to know if I was happy with what I did. And I'm like, I absolutely love what I do. Like, I just absolutely mm, love what I do because I get to wow. work with creatives. This is like 35 years of love. Like, honestly, I, I work with such great people. Creatives are just designers in general are just very nice people. I've never been paid late. Like, all my clients are super nice. Um and human beings. So it's been, it's been a great, like, it's been a great career path. You know, I that's, love it. That's, that, that's interesting because I feel like, especially in like this, especially now, mm -hmm. like the thinking, the business behind design yeah. is like, it's, 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 it's more on the fr the forefront now. Yes. You know but what it I mean? Wasn't when I started. Designers are much more empowered now and that the creative industry is much more empowered than just being a pixel pusher. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's exactly what it is. And it's been interesting for me to see that because when I first started my career, it was all these, so there were really no project managers and studio mm -hmm. managers. There were, there were account managers and agencies but it was just a bunch of designers running design, like running design studios, and they didn't know what they were doing. And I've seen over the course of my career how smart they've gotten. Like now this next generation, I think it's your generation, is particularly incredibly like they embrace business and they're not fearful of it. So as a part of that, my business has changed because they don't need me to do stuff that I needed to do for my clients years ago. Mm. You know, they need new stuff because they can do like I used to write proposals all the time. Now I don't have to write a proposal because all my clients are they're fine with writing proposals because mm. I think that's really I think your point is really well taken, which is that the business of design is very important right now. And people have embraced it and realized how important it is. And I love seeing that. I absolutely I feel like I've been a little bit a part of that, to be honest with you, because I've been mm. an advocate for the business of design for 30 years. Um so it's, yeah, I'm glad you noticed it. Cause I think it is true. I think the industry has changed that way. So my question to you is like, so I know because like the creative industry and designers in general have been a little bit more empowered 
like w- how has your role now morphed because i know you said you didn't do- you yeah. don't really do proposals on a lot of the yeah. hands-on stuff like how has your yeah. role morphed it's changed a lot it keeps changing every year honestly so there's a mm. few different things well when i first started my career i did stuff that's what i would say people people say hey i need you to interview somebody I need you to help me hire this person. I need you to write a proposal. How do I price that stuff? You know, so people were like very tactical. They need this. How do, I would do it for them. And pretty much I would do it. And over the years, and now it's, a, that's like, that used to be like 100% of what I did. Now that's like 5% of what I do. Mm. Um, and now what I really do is help my clients envision the current state of their business and where they want to take it and the steps mm-hmm. to getting there. So it's much more bigger picture. So it's the strategy mm-hmm. around their firm, how, they, um, how they're positioned, how um, the decisions they make around staffing and process and client management and project management um, and around positioning and all these things, how that they are all related and you have to have a vision for where you want to go. A lot of right. firms just started. They started their firm without a business plan. They didn't know where they were going and they we were doing really well, but now they're all starting to realize there's, it's a saturated market. There's a million, a billion design firms out there and they need to up their game. And that's what I help them do. So I spend a, a lot of my time mostly now helping them envision the future of their firm and giving them the actions to get there. So whether, I love that. yeah, it's fine. It's really great. So I, what it's the way it's manifested itself is usually I'll spend I call them business planning retreats where I spend a day with my clients, um, usually just the partners, really just like looking at the current state of like, what are they doing well? What are they doing? What are they struggling with? And then trying to solve their problems and set a vision for the future. Some of my clients still need to be fixed. So Mm -hmm. half the time those retreats are about, let's just fix the current state so that we can get to a future state. Right. So they mm, might just have right, some issues right. with staffing or issues with pricing or issues with positioning. Then once I fix that, I might come back in a few years and then help them with, OK, now we've got everything solid. Where do we take it next? Mm. Um, so I, it's a combination, but I just love it. And then I get to see my clients grow Girl. and change. Like I just met with two clients today just for an hour, each of them. And it was just more like a check-in like meeting just to see how everything was. And they both, ironically, had had a business retreat two years ago. Um, and they both were talking about still how that retreat has made, has helped them tremendously like make decisions, smarter decisions about their business. It's mm, like, so it's part cool. that they've created it. I'm just facilitating those discussions and giving them best practices. It's great. It's really I, fun. I love that. I love that. So, yeah. like, meeting, meeting with clients, you get in the... You get in these um, retreat meetings. Like, what would you say was like the top thing you say a uh, uh, agency issue that that you run into? Yeah, I just got asked this question yesterday. It's pretty funny. The same really? exact, the same exact question. They asked me wow. what's one thing that all design firms are struggling with. Um, I would say it's positioning. Mm. I think that a lot of firms are want to be generalists. Because that's what you, they don't want to specialize. They want to do all cool stuff. And I get that because creatives are, and I get that we can do all kind of cool stuff, right? Like we could, True. you know, we could design an environment. We could, you know, design a brochure. We could do a website. We could do all kinds of things, you know, because we're creatives. But clients, because there's so many of us out there, that's not how clients are going to find us and want to work with us, you know? Um, and a lot of creatives say, oh, it's my work that differentiates me. I, I hear this a lot. It's all my work. And, you know, <laughs> And <laughs> this is why my book is called Brutally Honest. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, it's not your work. You know, everybody thinks they're great designers. Everybody I've ever worked with thinks they're really talented, right? And it's not that they're not talented. It's just that they don't are not telling the clients the right messages. So the clients mm. want to work with them. So clients don't know what's good work and what's bad work. It's all subjective, right? Um, so it's, it's around, you know, knowing – their industry and being able to say that you're an expert in something and being able to prove it and also being able to communicate it because designers are really afraid of essentially taking a stake in the ground and saying, this is what I do. Right. So for me, I have like, I have a very clear positioning. I work with small to mid-sized creative firms. You know, I work with firms that are anywhere between two and 30 person firms. That's what I tell people. So anybody that's bigger, I don't work with them. It's a very clear Mm -hmm. market and it's very easy for me to find my clients that way because I know, the size of who they are, I know that they are creatives and for the most part graphic designers. And I, I think my clients 
also need to do that because here's the thing. Creatives always, they rely on referrals from new business, right? So all the work that's coming in is referrals. And that's great, right? So that means you're really great and the people like you. And I like that. But it's also allowing your clients and your contacts to drive the direction of your business. Mm, which That's true. Which you should be driving. So you're only getting the work that they're giving you, but you're not getting the work you maybe want to be doing. Mm. Um, and so you have to take cont- kind of the reins of the firm. Um, so that's what I try to teach my clients. And positioning is a way to do, do that because if you say you're positioned in something, so I have a client right now that's positioned in, um, uh, I have several clients. One, I have a firm that specializes in law firms, you know, branding for law firms. I have another client that specializes in branding for anybody that's in the race industry. So race, re- like retailers that sell sneakers, people that run races, companies that, you know, serve racers. Um, I have a client that specializes in um, mobility design. Like, so everybody, if they pick like a niche, um, they then know who to go after and right. and they can go to these com- conferences and go to, and read events and meet people that are in that circle like this is why most people don't do new business because they don't know where to start and so mm. it just gives them a, a starting point right dropping knowledge bombs yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love it and it and it's so true it's like as a as a agency if you have the position and you get up every day knowing where you're trying to go and who you're trying to talk to yeah exactly yeah where that what they want to talk about and where they meet and, exactly yeah that's yeah. true yeah so it's so just gives, the, and it doesn't the, mean you can't do other cool stuff like somebody randomly comes into your studio you could do that mm-hmm. i'm not saying you shouldn't do that stuff i'm just saying you should just know where you want to go and go after mm-hmm. what you want to do and i think that's what a lot of times that's the thought process. Like by you saying no, specialize in this. A lot of times people may interpret it as, oh, we can't do all this other stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they do. And I constantly have to reinforce it over and over again. That's not what I'm saying. You know, and I'm not even saying maybe you don't even have to say it on your website if you're scared of that. You know, first we could just start by just reaching out to the people that you want to work for and see if that works, you know. I will say this. Though. Most creatives will say to me, okay, I'll do that. I want to specialize in nonprofits or, or social good uh, at, or cultural or restaurants. Um, and that's because creatives love those kinds of c- communities. But those are not specializations because every designer in the world works for nonprofits because we're all good that's people. That's true. We want to change the world, <laughs> right? So that's not a specialty anymore because everybody does that. Mm. And same with restaurants. You know, everybody Everyone wants to design a restaurant because it's cool and fun work. And the same yeah. thing with cultural institutions. Who's, who's going to say no to working for like a museum, you know? Right. So I have to get them to even think further about what that, where within those areas they specialize. Like mm. I have a, a client that specializes in regional museums. So that's a little mm. bit more narrow, right? Yeah, that's very I have another specific. Client that spe- yeah, and I have another one that specializes in community development. So it's still nonprofit, but it's more focused around uh, nonprofits that help build communities and develop communities, mm. which is pretty like broad. It. But still, it's nice, you know. So that's what I try to get my clients to understand. You know, I try I not, like and, I, and I'm not, I'm like, I'm not telling them what they should do. I'm just helping them figure out from what they already love and do. How can we, how can we position that better? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. So let's segue yeah. into brutally honest. Like why? Yeah. Why did you want to write this book? A good question. <laughs> In retrospect, what the hell was I thinking? Oh, this is supposed to be, <laughs> supposed to be PG. Nah, Sorry. You're good. You're yeah. good. You're I love good. that you told you're me that good. was PG. Uh, <laughs> you tell your audience that you told me to be PG because I'm not very good at PG. Um <laughs> If you'll see my book, there's a curse in the word in the title. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, so I am 57, and wow. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> and I can't work with everybody, and I work with uh, you know just only. You know, I have a bunch of people that work for me, but uh, it's mostly me and a resource of people. So I can't work with everybody. I'm very picky about who I work with. And I was also, so I wanted to spread my knowledge to, honestly, this is what I want to do. I want to spread the knowledge of all the things that I had learned over my career um, through my clients to people that couldn't afford to work with me. I also did it because 
I'm getting a little pissed at our industry. Keep trying to keep PG. I think people are practicing unethical or possibly un- damaging behaviors that are hurting our industry. And I think I would want, I wanted to sort of spread the word, like there's some best practices here about how we should be tr- managing our clients. How should we be pricing? How do we value ourselves? How do we allow, how we, do we work with our clients so that they don't, we're not walked all over, right? So I'm on this sort of mission. This is my last, in the last two years, it's, I'm on this mission to start yelling at the industry and telling them all the things that they're doing wrong that are hurting us. So when we make decisions about our own career, I think that's very selfish. I think we need to think about what is the impact that we have, not only on the world, but our industry in particular. And I, don't, I just wanted to spread, like, here's what I think we should be doing and see what they think. Um, so that's kind of why I did it. Um, so those two reasons. One, I wanted to spread the knowledge, and the second was to sort of sh- shake things up a little bit and say, I have some strong points of view about what I think we're doing to hurt our industry. And, and so I, I spoke at the AIJ National Conference last year, and that was my main stage talk. It was called It's Your Fault. And I blamed the industry on some of the status, some of the things we're struggling with, like clients not wanting to pay us as much as they used to pay us. Like they're undervaluing what we do for our deliverables. They don't understand the value of designing. And people get mad at the clients when I think it's actually designers' faults. They've undervalued ourselves. Yeah, because like at the end of the day, like a client will only pay us what we charge them. Yeah, exactly. And if they can get it somewhere else for a <laughs> lot, if they could get it somewhere else, they're going to be like, they can <laughs> always say, listen, I can go over here and get right. it for that price. If right, that, exactly. If that doesn't exist, then. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I understand people have to make a living and some people right. are like, I really want to work on this project. So I want to underbid. But it's funny. I don't think it's like students or young designers that are only doing this. I think it's like people who have their own firms who are pretty famous, big names, you'd be surprised how much they're underbidding because they're doing corporate work and they want to get in the cool work. So they underprice the cool work, but mm. that's not fair to the people that that's what they do for a living. And True. so I just have some challenges with, with what I think people are doing um, for that very reason. I love reason. that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, if if every designer thought like that, we wouldn't be having these issues with like exactly. pricing and stuff like that. Yeah. And even diversity, you know, like we're having trouble with diversity, but we've mm. never, what, it's all of a sudden this thing that we have to worry about now. We should have been worried about it years ago. Like, right. I just think we have to right. just shake things up a little bit. I love that. I love that. Yeah. That's, that's, that I'm really like, so now I'm even more intrigued. Now I'm even more, <laughs> more intrigued. I'm even yeah. More so what 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 are some of the like the 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 stories that you've heard like you know just being with this book being out what are some of the stories that you've heard good oh, or maybe it's, been, if there it's is bad. been awesome honestly I have not heard any negativity whatsoever everybody's been really like I've been getting love mail like or love Instagram or love tweets from yeah from everybody and I think people are like showing me pictures of the book with kind of all these post-it notes and highlights and how much it's saved their lives. And I, I think it's made a really big difference, honestly. And then some people were like, it's just made me, it's reinforced that I was doing everything well. So sometimes I'm hearing, it was great to hear that they were doing everything right. But for the most part, I think even if they came away, I keep hearing this, like come away with one takeaway, right? So if you look at my Instagram or you look at my Twitter, I kind of repost all this stuff. And I'm always interested to hear what people, what resonates with people. And there's not one particular thing in the book. It really depends. But I do think that what I'm saying in the book, because it's extremely direct. I don't, I, you know, for the people who haven't read the book, the book is written and designed for designers. So it's very much like straightforward. It's bulleted, narr- it's not a lot of copy to read, it's like information graphics, so it's very easy to digest, and I think designers can then scan it and get value from it. Um, I guess I have gotten, so some of them, I think the thing that has most impacted people is there's a chapter of, about is not sustainable. And so some people have come back to me and told me that has changed their lives, and other people sort of like get mad at me. 
Um, but in, in a wonderful way, like it, it stimulates conversation. Basically, I'm saying that it's because we have so many, when you run a business, you have a lot of different hats, right? You have to wear uh, the financial hat. You have to wear the new business hat. You have to wear the visionary hat. You have to wear the staff management hat. It was different hats. And not one person can do all of those things. And, and what happens is if any one of those things or any one of the things that you're supposed to be doing as an owner gets neglected, then your business suffers. And I, saw, I find the solopreneurships at, at some point level out and there's no growth. They just, uh, it's just not, they can still survive, but they don't have any, um, they can't get any better in terms of like how, you know, pricing higher or better quality clients. Some people have disagreed with me, but for the most part, I, I stand by my belief on that. And so I think that chapter has made people, the way I wrote it, I think it's really resonated with people who may have argued with me about that, but then they saw my point when I started talking about why it's not sustainable. Um, and so I think that has had the most impact in terms of just with the audience. I think people have found that really interesting, but I also think there's other things in the book. Um, so the book has a lot of, um, case studies from my clients in there from other designers. So there's, I think 20 different case studies from all different people that, so for me, appears. And so I think people that like, they loved hearing what other people were doing, um, that helped their business. So I think, yeah, it's had incredible feedback. I don't know if there was one thing in particular. Um, and the other thing I think I love is that it's really gone global. Like I'm getting so many orders from across the world. Um, uh, and I didn't expect that. Wow. I expected it to be just like a United States thing, but it's been really like, I'm going to Dublin next week to speak in Amsterdam. I went to Australia. Australia's huge creative community, which I had no idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, they do. I've met a few just yeah. through like the podcast. Yeah, it's huge and really wonderful creative community. So I spoke at the Creative Mornings out in Melbourne this summer. Um, so it's been really, wow. it's been great. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been very, I've been honored by all the great feedback. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what would you say was like the hardest struggle that you had to overcome through this entire process? Wow, the book? Mm. Uh, the whole, with what the entire, you're asking me what I struggled with with the well, book? Oh, in general. In it general. could be the book. It could be anything. Oh, that's a good question. Well, for the book, I think it was the actual publishing process. Like, it's self-published. So I had to figure out, I had to do a Kickstarter, which was a lot of work. I had to get an editor. I had to get a, you know, I had to, I had an editor. I had a project manager. I had a proofreader. I had like a posse of people and to manage all those people was a lot of work. And I literally am the one shipping the books. So, you know, I just shipped four books tonight. Like every night my husband and I just pack a bunch of books. So I think that's been really interesting. In terms of my career, I actually have been very lucky. I have not had many struggles with my career. Um, I think I'm encountering a little bit of, uh, yeah, I don't even know if that's it. Uh, when I first started my career, I was the only consultant out there. It was me and like David Baker from recourses. So both of us were sort of leading the way. And now there's tons of people out there who are business consultants for creatives. So there's much more competition, but I embrace that because there's so many designers. Um, so I think the only thing would be to just dif- continue to, for me to differentiate myself. And the book has helped me a lot to, because I think there's a little, I think there's some sexism in the industry to be sexism and ageism and all kinds of isms in our industry. Um, mm. and I've encountered sexism and ageism simply because I think male consultants in general have made more money and have gotten the bigger speaking engagements. And if you look at all the business books out there, most of them are written by men. So I have been doing it just as long as they have and decided I, I needed to have a voice in that. Um, so that's been really interesting right. also to be, I wanted to be sort of the leading female in that. Like I was one, I was one of the early speakers at every conference and back then they didn't have a lot of women speakers. Now they have a lot of women speakers. So it was kind of cool to lead the way for that. Um, and to see other women speakers now speaking, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just rambling, but yeah, that's basically it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. No, I mean, I, 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 cause when I earlier in like the days of the podcast, like I had um, some female cre- um, women creatives on and like behind the scenes, one of them were talking to me and they were like, Daryl, you know, I really appreciate you having me on the podcast. 
you know like nope. female creatives nope. uh, don't really get asked to do stuff for the most part so and at that time yeah. i was just asking because i thought they were cool and you know i liked their work and whatever but after i had that conversation i made like a yeah. conscious effort to like get more women on and stuff like that because they also have a voice and i think they're awesome too so my question to you is like as a male with you know with some form of a platform, how can we help yeah. to like not have that happen? Because it is a thing. You know what I mean? Well, it's like unconscious bi right, bias, right. right? We all have unconscious bias. I'm learning a lot about that. Uh, I don't know if I should be telling you this, but I, I'll just speak honestly. I went to, I spoke um, to a black woman designer and she like read me the riot act about, what it was like to be a black woman designer. And I had no idea. So it's hard for people to speak from their own personal perspective to educate people. I think it's just about being conscious of your unconscious bias. Um, and to recognize, I think, you know what I think it is? I think designers have a tendency to put people on pedestals and have superstars, right? So if you think about who the superstars are, for the most part, they're mostly men. There's a few out there there that women like Jessica Hish is one of those that I think resonates with people. There are some women that do that, but I think we need to stop putting people in pedestals. And if we are to be on pedestals, just make sure that there is a diverse group of people up there. That is not just all white men. Oh, trust me. I understand. I understand, yeah, so I don't know what else I understand you know. where you're coming yeah. from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and supporting each other. I just think we should all support yes, each other. And, and you know, it's, it's, it, it's something that I feel like is getting better. Oh, it's getting better, but we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, we have a long way to go. Yeah. And I think we, we don't realize that there is sexism, particularly sexism in our profession. I mean, there's lots of, like I said, other things. But the reason why I think there's a lot of sexism is because of just the kind of preconceived notions of women mm -hmm. in general that people have always had. Like, oh, well, they're going to leave us when they get pregnant right. or, you know, like... I think still people have that and they don't speak it out loud, mm -hmm. but they do. And then we have to kind of change right. that. Um, and women have to stand up for themselves too a little bit. I don't know if we do that enough. Um, and a lot of women, it's really interesting. I think uh, my female clients don't like speaking as much as my male clients. And so I think the women have to speak up and say, we exist. We have our own firms. You right. know, like I think there are a lot of women design, design firm owners um, more than I think people have been quoted as stating, because I know most of my clients are mm. women oh, business owners, not all of them. Um, so I think there are, but they're just not out there as right, much right. or as well recognized. I mean, there are some obviously that are more recognized than others, but I, I yeah. agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So who are those people yeah. that Emily has in her circle her support system the people that build you up the people that keep you going who are those people in your life yes that's my family See? and my clients so my husband in particular Aww. is just as just as beautiful brutally honest he's not like romantic and sweet <laughs> he's very like <laughs> he's he's very much like we're very like direct and he's pushed me throughout my entire career you know like he um when i first so I was working as a studio manager in a design firm and I was doing a lot of like freelance work consulting. And my husband's like, you, this is a business. You should start your business. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. I, I'm just doing this for fun. And he's like, no, this is a business. I'm like, well, I can't do that because I don't have a fax machine. That's why I said to him. Because <laughs> it was 30 years ago. This is like the so, most <laughs> random thing to pull out though. <laughs> I just think because I don't have a fax machine. You have to remember, like, I'm older than you. Back then, you, the way you communicated was, like, faxing yeah. things. So uh, so he got me a fax machine the next day. Um, and then I be, opened my own firm. And then I, he said to me, you know, you should be speaking. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm scared of speaking. And he's the one who pushed me to speak, wow. be a public speaker. And then, you know, so every step of my career has always pushed me, like, or just in, in, helped me recognize that's my next mm. level. So... You know, I've been talking about this book for a really long time, and then my he got my kids to join in on the the chorus. So the three of them were pushing me to write a book. Mm. Um, so they kind of pushed me to say, "It's time. This is when you're going to do it." Um, so I think it's definitely my family has been pushing and pushing and pushing the whole way. 
<laughs> uh, that's awesome though. So I think that's awesome that that's they even just thing. recognize that, you know, yeah, that no, it's part been, of your your life. Yeah, no, it's been great. Um and I would also say it's my clients because I learn so much from them and they so support me and everything I do and they're so proud of me. Like it's so fun because I'm proud of them, but that they're equally proud of me. I kind of love that. Um yeah. So it, I, I think my clients help me and they're always like, you should do this. I'm like, well, I've never done that. Well, you can do that. You're smart. You can do it. You know, they, they're constantly asking me for more stuff. Like, so the way my business has evolved is them just saying, I need you to do this. And I'm like, but I've never done that before. Mm. <laughs> and they're like, but we trust you and you're smart and you think, and you can do it. And so they did what I do for them, which is just keep popping me up and saying, you can do all this stuff. And that's basically how my business has grown. So my clients are like all my clients are my friends, you know, for the most part. That's, that's, that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. When I'm going to I'm cool. speaking in Dublin next week, um, and one of my clients called me up and said, she's going to the conference in Dublin. I'm like, She's from New York. Why are you going to Dublin? She goes, well, I saw you speaking. I'd like to support you. And I have friends in Dublin. So I'm going to come out with you. That's amazing. Which is kind of cool, right? Like my client is coming to see me yeah. speak. So in Dublin, like crazy. Um, that's great. Like I spoke at a small little event at the Type Directors Club. And in the front row, okay. my, my, I had three or four clients who just came out to support me. You know, even though they that's, saw me speak, that's... you know, they, they work with me every day. They just want to see me speak and support me, you know. So I think that is pretty cool, honestly. You know, yeah, yeah. It is, that, that, that is a cool feeling. Yeah. I, I, I remember he wasn't a client, but just a creative friend. I was speaking at a conference and I just saw him walk in and sat at the front row. It just, you know what I mean? It does yeah. something for you. It so, makes you I feel mean, good. I'm yeah. I'm there with you. Yeah. And yeah, also, I'm I've there been, with you. I'm there with I, you. I just believe in being a good person. And I think because I'm a good person, I attract good people. And so I have just good people in my life, you know? So, um, I really do. Like I've never really had to, I, I know it's supposed to be PG, but I've never had an asshole client. You know, like I've just never had a client that's been terrible. You know, yeah. um, they might've been prima donnas. And I think but, you, it, it's also, it's also the fact that you, the way you have what you do structured to, because I believe that the way how we communicate as creatives also attracts yeah. the clients that we don't want. Exactly. 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 That's exactly true. Um, and same with my book because I call it brutally honest people who are afraid of being of my style of directness are not going to work with me. And that's great. Right. That's cool. I'm, right. I'm fine with it's that. Another form. It's another form of filtering. It, it's which exactly. We all need to have yep. as much filters as we can have yeah. filter. <laughs> like I joke that a lot of my clients are either from the East or West coast. I don't have a lot of clients from like the South or from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> because oh yeah, I, I know what you're talking about because uh, it was a rude awakening for me from leaving new york to come to the south it was right. a very rude awakening for me so i know exactly yeah what you're exactly about. but now I, i'm building I like i do have clients directness. in the south and in the midwest but not as many as i would normally because yeah, yeah you know you're a displaced new yorker <laughs> in, living in georgia you know which is it's a culture yeah, shock it, it, yeah yeah it is on both ends yeah <laughs> Because yeah. they weren't ready for me either. No, exactly. <laughs> I know. But it's good, right? We're, we're, we're all living in our bubbles and we need to break out of those bubbles and meet people out of the world. That's so, true. That's one thing I love about that is traveling true. is that I've got to meet all these amazing people that I would not have normally met. You know, like I had like mm -hmm. crazy, but I had a Hasidic, so I'm Jewish, but I had a Hasidic Jewish client who had a Hasidic Jewish design firm. So they were all wow. Hasids. And I was like, I don't know if I can work with them. Like, my husband's like, why? That's like, that's prejudice. <laughs> and I'm like, I guess it is. And they turned out to be the loveliest people in the world. They didn't shake my hand, which is cool. Because, you know, men, they don't shake women's hands. But right. it was great. They were super nice. Like, you know, I just started realizing the world is not, there's lots of different people and they're all really good people. Right. So. Yeah, it's true. Starting to learn that. It's true. It's yeah. true. It's true. All right. So what is that thing that Emily can't live without that it's not her phone. My dog? Oh, I like I think it. It's my dog. I like it. Unconditional like love. It. You know, whatever. Like it. It's like, yeah, I think it's my dog. Uh I like it. 
Are you looking for a, like a, a, a tool? I should say, I'll I mean, say my husband or my kid. Choice. I'm going to say my dog. Um, it, 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 <laughs> my it's kids your are going to get choice, mad that I didn't trust say me, that. I've heard, I've no, heard a lot of different things. Some some yeah. extremely weird. And, you know, uh, one person said toilet paper. So it, it, it varies. <laughs> I, I'm sure, like, so that's an animal. Like, if it's an object, what's the one thing I can't live without? Uh, does anybody say their phone? Is that why you nope. told me not to tell, say their phone? Well, I just feel like we're all, we all would say our phones. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just feel like, because it's, it's, it's not just the phone anymore. Yeah, no, it's our whole lives. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a planner, it's a navigation, it's, it's everything. Yeah. You know, so I figured that's like the universal, our phones. I just wanted to kind of hear something different. One person, a grown person, said their blanket. Yep. They got a heated blanket and they love their heated yep. blanket. And I'm like, no judgment over here. You know what I mean? I know so my daughter has. It's just cool to hear those things. I don't have those things. I, it's, I actually, my, I just got my daughter a gravity blanket. She loves it. Do you know those things? Gravity wow. blankets? They, like, they weigh I, like five or it. ten pounds and they help you sleep at night. So. Mm. What is the I should one? think about that for my wife. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's one thing that I can't live without. It's really funny you ask that right now because I'm going to this point in my life where we're moving from a big house to an apartment. And so I think this is why I don't have an answer to the question. We're getting rid of everything in our lives. We're purging everything mm. except our clothes and our art. So it's been very interesting you. to get rid of all this stuff. So I feel like I'm less attached to objects than I used to be. For that very reason. I love it. I love it. I love it. Me, we, me and my family, we were pretty close to that direction, yeah. too. Like, we, we were transforming a bus into a mini home right now. We're Are in we the really? middle of all of that, like, transforming all of that. Because we love to travel. And that's usually where our biggest investment goes into. So, What kind of bus? What to, kind of bus did you get? It's, I think it's like a Ford. It's a Ford. Um, it's like one of those old um, assist, assisted living type buses okay. with like oh, the wheelchair cool. um, thing in the back and stuff like uh-huh. that. So I'm with you on the traveling and the downsizing. Yeah. Like yeah. we literally have very little attachment to stuff. Yeah. I just and need I, Wi-Fi I, and my computer and I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you don't need stuff anymore, right? So, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, All right. that's, that's cool. But, All right, so book recommendations outside of the amazing, brutally honest book. Any other book re- recommendations? Um, so I, I'm a big reader, huge reader, and I think mostly I read novels because I do business all day long. Mm-hmm. I don't want to read business books. I think the two business books that I've had made admiration for are written by my friends. One is called um, uh, The Business of Expertise by David Baker. Okay. It's called of expertise let me look and the other one is by alina wheeler called um designing brand identity okay it's a great book um i really love that book quite a lot it inspired me to write my book actually mm. um let me, let me tell you yes yeah, so designing brand identity by alina wheeler and oh yeah the business of expertise by david baker so the business of expertise Sweet. by David Baker. I wish I read that. I'm very jealous that I wish he, I wrote that book. It's basically the cause for why we should be experts and specialize. Um, it's a very mm. easy book to read and um, straightforward. I really like that book. And the business and the and the des- uh, brand, uh, the building brand uh, designing brand identity by Alina Wheeler is in I think like the seventh edition, and it's a brilliant book about like the steps to designing a brand identity include strategy, data okay. briefs. And so I think those two books, and I also love this, another book that I think is out of print, um, called you don't, un- you just don't understand me by mm. Deborah Tannen. And it's about, and it's called like, it's about women and men and how they have different communication styles. Mm. Um, which is, which is, we all know is very true. Yeah, it was, it was, first of all, it saved my marriage reading that book. Uh, Honestly, like that's, it saved my marriage, but it also taught me how to amazing, how to work though. with my clients better because women and men have been culturized to te- communicate differently, and so to learn that was mm-hmm. to me like when I read that book, it changed my life. So that's, yeah, that's that's I that's saying, awesome. Yeah, just, I, I like that. I like that. Just read. I think I like everybody that. should read more. There's so many great books out there. So many. That is true. Brilliant books out that's there. That's true. Yeah. 
All right, so what's next? What's next for Emily? Oh, if you haven't mentioned it already, what is next for Emily? That's a good question. That's what I'm thinking about now. Like, what is next? I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm actually at that very point in my life. Like, what is next? Um, mm. I think it's going to be running a brutally honest event mm. that's related to the book. So some sort of conference or, but something different. I don't know what that is yet. I, in the past, I've written, I've run business symposiums, but I sort of want to do something a little different. I'm not sure what that is yet. Mm. Um, but there'll be an announcement soon, probably in the next year or two that I'll be wanting. But I think that's it is something like that. I already teach. I wrote a book. I, you know, consult. I've done a lot of things already. I speak, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like I've done a lot of things with my career. So thinking about what's next has been very interesting to me. It's not going to be a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... It's it's turned into something that I didn't know it would turn into. I didn't know I would ever have a team for a podcast. So it's turned yeah. into something that I did not expect. But it's a Do good like it's it? a good it's like all good, but yeah. it's just more than yeah. I thought it would turn into. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the one thing I don't think I'm interested in doing, but <laughs> I like speaking in podcasts, but I don't I don't think I want to have podcasts. I think yeah, I think it's gonna be some sort of event. Something very interesting. Like I really like to get other creatives to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. So it's something around fellow people in the similar same business model. Maybe it's partners in a business. Like anybody that's partnership, they all meet together and talk about what it's like to be a partner mm. in a business. I'm, I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, that sounds interesting, though. It sounds interesting. Yes. I love it. Yeah, so we'll see. So as we're getting ready to close, what advice? I mean, you've given a ton of advice, but what advice yeah. would you have for creatives? Spread the love, build the love. Mm. What I mean by that is just be a, a really good person and be yourself and authentic and, and get out of your shell. So if you are, you know, one, uh, if you stay in your little studio and your little sphere and you don't meet a lot of people, I don't, I think that's very limiting. So I would say that my biggest advice is just to get out of your own shell and to meet people and just be a good person. And so when you're meeting with clients, and you're meeting with anybody, anybody, you should just be yourself. Right. Because they'll want to work with you. So to me, it's about building the love and telling people, I love what I do. Because you should love what you do, right? right. Um, and just tell people that. Tell everybody how much they love you love what you do. And they'll want to work with you. And they're going to tell everybody else that how much you love the work, right? Sweet. So I think... I think that's the, that's my biggest piece of advice. I love it. I love it. Especially yeah. just the idea of building relationships have just really... I think sped up my career so i'm definitely with you on that yeah right we all have these community people that support us when i wrote this book i was floored by how many people came out of the woodwork who i've known my entire career but i haven't spoken to in 30 years you know who came out to support me Mm. like because i've we stayed in touch but i don't really see them anymore we might be on twitter or we might be on instagram um like our friends are our friends for our lives, right? right? We might not see them all the time. Right. And when I when, when my book came out, I can't tell you how many people helped spread the love about the book. Like I was really surprised. I didn't even have to ask them; they just did it out of the goodness of their hearts. I love that. You know, yeah. that to me is that's incredible, right? And same same with you, right? You you have this community of people that you all support each other, and I think that's really important. Yes, it is very important. Very important. All right, so. Yeah. Where can people go to find you, learn more about what you're doing? Where can they go? Yeah. So the book, it's very important to say the book is not on Amazon. It's self-published, so it's only available on my website at emilycohen.com or on the self-published site booksellersdaughter.com because I'm a daughter of a bookseller. Um, That's the only place you can get the book. I love it. Uh, And that's that's where you can learn about me. It's on my site. You can follow me on social media. I'm on all of the social media channels. Pretty much I'm on, uh, largely on Instagram, but I'm also a little bit on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and all that other stuff. So, Well, Emily, this has been amazing. Thank you for taking the time out. This has just been awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope it's been super valuable to you and you're now ready to take your audience building, your community growing to the next level to help you and help me build our empire for lack of a better word or just to build our thing 
Um, remember to stop by iTunes, Passion Behind the Art, and leave a review and subscribe. It's very important to me. It helps the podcast grow. And it makes me feel good to kind of hear from you guys to know what you like about this podcast, what it's done for you. So jump on iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. Passion Behind the Art. Be blessed.